Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the silver chart from netdania.com. You can see we've got a breakout here from the trend channel that goes back from February or so. Uh, we're going to get to that in a second here. I want to play a little bit of the Peter Schiff today. It's good to hear Peter mention silver and uh, play a little bit of this and then uh, talk about the chart here a lot. <laughs> Well, hi-ho silver seems to be the rallying cry for the day. You know, the last podcast that I recorded, I talked about the breakout in silver, and I actually regretted the fact that I didn't get a chance to talk about silver during my CNBC interview. I had meant to say something about it, but it slipped my mind. But on the last podcast, I mentioned how strong silver had been looking, and it held up extremely well in the gold sell-off of the prior few days. And sure enough, we have a big breakout again today. Silver, now I'm recording this uh, a little before 1 o'clock in the Eastern time zone here on Tuesday. And so silver's pulled back below 17. But earlier this morning, it was up, you know, about 85 cents or so. Silver was above $17. That was the first time it's been above $17 all year. As I'm recording right now, it's at 16.88, so it's only up 68 cents. Gold's up 21.50 right now, back at 12.54. But gold's still well below the highs. I mean, gold needs to rally about 30 bucks to get back to its high for this move. But silver made a new high today, and I mentioned on the last podcast that I thought the strength in silver uh, was a good. Uh, a leading indicator for both gold and silver. And I talked about all these guys that had been shorting silver. That had been a popular trade when the gold to silver ratio was breaking down against silver. Uh, some people decided that they would try to short that move, which I thought made no sense. Uh, to me, it was a much better trade to buy silver when it's been as cheap as it's ever been relative to gold. I and th that's a really good point. I think we hit 80 was uh, the gold-silver ratio top that we hit. Uh, people are putting out gold-silver uh, charts now. But uh, if you just think about, there's so many statistics, the ones that Eric Sprott talks about all the time, the amount of silver that's bought, uh, physical, you know, the coins that are stacked uh, compared to gold, the dollars spent compared to gold, all of that, uh, the, the amount of silver taken out of the ground, compared to gold, uh, an 80 to 1 uh, silver to gold ratio is absolutely ridiculous. But that's the world we live in. But we're seeing it change really quickly. You can see here on this chart, uh, I want to talk a lot about this chart. Let's get into the one minute here because uh, we actually have another after hours move happening in silver. And uh, this is the one minute you can see that uh, in the after hours now, silver is racing back above 17 and it's putting in a higher high than it did during the day. Uh, let's pull in the volume here to see if it's significant. It, it is fairly significant volume for after hours. It's not shocking volume, but it's fairly significant. So, of course, all of us are waiting to see if we get that gigantic smackdown that's always been the pattern. But uh, what can happen sometimes is that the patterns stop occurring. And, and when that happens, if the people who are manipulating silver back off, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about this uh, Chinese gold exchange that's opened up and, and potential trading, yuan-based trading in, in gold, and then eventually, of course, silver, um, that it may be a game changer. It's very interesting that it is today's date, the 19th of April, when this uh, Chinese exchange came online. But we're going to talk about that when we talk about arbitrage. Now, I want to talk about Clive Mond. I I'm not going to, you know, I, it, the purpose is not to uh, beat him or anything, but uh, the article here we have, the most recent one, the silver update, this goes to show you how wrong you can be when you are using uh, technicals in a down market uh, when the market has changed. So you can see here, I'm going to read a little bit of this and then go back to the chart and show you what's happening. 
this is uh, Clive Mon's update from the 16th. The combination of silver having arrived at short-term target with bearish-looking candlesticks appearing, gold completing a head and shoulders top, and the latest commitment of traders for both gold and silver being at the sort of extreme readings characteristic of a top, all point to silver reversing to the downside here. On a six-month chart, we can see how silver's sharp advance over the past week or so has brought it up to a trend channel target where the advance has run into trouble with bearish-looking candlesticks in recent days, suggesting it will soon drop away again. So there's the chart. You can see that it's a fairly valid technical chart. One would expect that uh, if this trend channel follows any sort of historical uh, tradition that yes then it would come right back down here and correct back down to around 15 but let's go to the chart and look it didn't do that it didn't do that in any way you can see I've drawn in lines that roughly parallel the ones that Clive Mond had drawn in and you can see clearly on the MACD uh, we have this overbought condition right there but this is what happens when markets change direction. Uh, I've covered many, many times how the MACD is a good indicator in a how you use the MACD in a downtrending market, how you use the MACD in a sideways market, and how you use the MACD in an uptrending market. And of course, in a downtrending market, the sell signals on the MACD are valid. Uh, in a sideways market, both the buy and sell signals are valid, but in an uptrending market, the buy signals are valid and the sell signals are not valid. Now, the most dangerous place to be is a changing market, one that is actually moving from a downtrend to an uptrend or even from a sideways trend to an uptrend. So uh, let's pull back here and look at the daily chart and uh, let me point out to you again the importance of the volume here. Actually, we need to do the weekly and probably even the monthly. Yeah, we'll do the monthly. And uh, again, the importance of this volume because this volume increase here, which is absolutely phenomenal, is the only way to describe it. Uh, as I said before, if we get an up move that's something like what we had in 2008, then all of this volume coming in becomes buying volume. The further you get on a chart, uh, when you have a spike of volume, if, for example, at this point here, we have a massive volume spike, then obviously that makes that an extremely valid signal and you can see what happens. I don't have the volume here, unfortunately, but my guess is there was a massive spike in volume at this bottom. And uh, when you get that, you can see you, you get real rallies. Uh, are we on the verge of something like that? Well, we could be. Now let's get back to the area that I was talking about of the resistance area. And uh, what I was saying about that resistance area let's pull the indicators off again what I was saying is that silver has a major congestion area right in here and for me a move to $18 especially a move to $18.50 is going to pretty much put away all that congestion it's going to bring us into a challenging of this congestion area, which is marked by a low of 18 and a high all the way up here, really. But we'll just draw it in tighter to get most of this of between 18 and 22. That's where we're going to put the next congestion area. Now, what is shocking is how fast silver has blasted through this this congestion area uh, you can see from the price we're at right now we're at 1717 there really only are a couple of spike tops here that are above that area we, we're almost chewing through all of the congestion already now what is behind this move 
Well, I think that uh, the revelation from Deutsche Bank that there's an admission of silver manipulation, uh, I think you should go to the Daily Coin and listen to the interview um, with uh, the guy, I think it's Paul from China. That's a very interesting interview. And, uh, you know, that this Chinese thing is coming online. We have the admission from Deutsche Bank that they manipulated the silver market and then we have this Chinese exchange coming online and this is for gold uh, as far as I know there hasn't been an announcement for a silver market that is going to be priced in yuan but I would expect that to be the case so um, before we go into this main argument about arbitrage let me uh, pull up the cross rate on the Chinese yuan and this is going to be very very important going forward because if the Chinese are doing what I think they are planning on doing uh, we will see very very radical moves in the Chinese currency as well as the silver and gold price now the reason I say that is because I'm talking about how arbitrage is going to come into this mix and uh, how setting another price target for actual delivery, a real competing market to the Western markets, uh, what that does, what that creates for an arbitrage opportunity. So before we get to arbitrage and talk a lot about that, uh, let's pull up, uh, I think the one we were looking at was uh, First Majestic uh, Silver. And uh, I want to pull up that chart to show you what happened today. Uh, again, I don't put a lot of stock in the silver miners, but uh, I showed you the daily chart before where we had that magnificent move up and it looked like everything was going to sell off that was right there but look what happened uh, it flipped around went the other way and actually had a gap up and look at that we're talking about twelve dollars and fifty cents price for first majestic and that's a move from a january january of this year low of three dollars and fifty cents we're talking about uh, Three dollars and fifty cents uh, times three is uh, ten fifty. So we're we're at almost a four hundred percent move in the price of this stock. The other one we looked at was Pan American Silver. And you can see a similar pattern here. Not as large of a percentage move from the bottom, but again a gap up day a very very big day and uh, again I've said many many times uh, buying the miners is can be a very dangerous proposition because if you don't pick the bottom at the right time in, in other words if the precious metals don't bottom at the time or near the time you're stacking these paper shares of miners then what can happen is that the company can go bankrupt before you can see a return. Now, if you time everything exactly right and you get it at just the right time, and as I said before, uh, we're going to know it's the right time when it's too late. Uh, it's already too late for First Majestic. You should have gone in at 350, and we're now over 12. Uh, but it looks like it's the same thing for Pan American Silver. Big, big moves. So let's get back to the silver chart and talk about what I think is behind this move. And I think it's all going to end up being related to arbitrage. So this is really, really important to me because I think that this is a confirmation that uh, arbitrage is going to be the explanation of what's happening here. Even though the move is happening in silver, I'm going to explain why even though there isn't a uh, Chinese market for silver right now. Uh, let's jump real quick over to Bitcoin and you can see here we're still in a valid, a very, very valid pennant formation. Uh, it's not as valid, it's not as perfect as it was. Uh, it was 
textbook perfect when it was, uh, well, it's not letting me draw the lines, but it was a textbook perfect pennant uh, back in here. But uh, you can see that it is kind of doing a cup and saucer rounding up here. And I think that Bitcoin is probably going to continue to rally from here and ultimately have a big break and challenge the old highs. Now, let's jump over to Drudge real quick and look at the results. That's very encouraging for me because uh, one of the people who really angered me more than anyone else in this uh, election cycle is Ted Cruz. And the reason I don't like Ted Cruz so much is because I think he's a liar. I don't believe that Ted Cruz is a Christian, a fundamentalist Christian. Now, I certainly don't believe Trump is or Kasich or any of the rest of these people. But Ted claims to be one of us. And I don't believe he is. Now, these results are very encouraging for me. I think that both Kasich and Cruz are despicable people for still being in the race because I think their only intention is to steal away uh, votes from Trump. It's very, very clear that people want Trump. Um, I have no idea who Trump is, what he is, where he's coming from. But uh, the only reason why I'm in favor of him is because everyone's against him. That is the only possible indication that he could be an outsider. I don't know what he is. But the fact that everyone is against him, and he said a lot of things that uh, I think are interesting, like uh, um, dismantling NATO and uh, admitting what the alternative media... It's very interesting to see a candidate to come up and do so well uh, talking what we talk about in the alternative media. But the most encouraging thing for me is to see Ted Cruz, who I think is a despicable liar, and I think uh, the truth is coming out about him probably and his affairs and everything else. We'll see. But to see him lose to Trump really bad and to see him lose to Kasich, that's a very encouraging thing for me. That's just my personal opinion. I could be wrong. So... Let's look at this arbitrage and talk about what I think is behind what's going on in the precious metals right now. Now, for those of you who trade cryptocurrencies, obviously arbitrage is something that uh, if you do what I do, it's something you do deal with every day. Uh, I have a certain amount of coins, various cryptocurrencies on exchanges like Poloniex, Bittrex, Yobit, uh, BTCE, other ones. And uh, if you're involved in cryptocurrencies and you have a bunch of them on different exchanges, then arbitrage is something that you understand. It's very, very simple. You could, I could log in right now to my Bittrex account and I could see that people, if people are buying my flooring coins for, say, uh, say a price of 500 over on Bittrex, and, uh, and I have both Bitcoin and Florin coin on that exchange. And I go and log into Poloniex and uh, see that people are selling them for around 400. Uh, they're buying them for 500 on one exchange where I have both coins and they're selling them on another exchange for 400. That is money in the bank. That means that I can simultaneously execute an order to sell X amount of coins, whatever I can do at one price and buy at another. If I can sell at 500 and buy at 400 at the exact same time, then I lock in a profit. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's an arbitrage and it's a situation where it's guaranteed money. So that's what arbitrage is. And uh, let's read the Wikipedia explanation. I'm going to talk about what's going on in China. Arbitrage in economics and finance. Arbitrage is the practice of taking advantage of price difference, a price difference between two or more markets, striking a combination of matching deals that capitalize on the imbalance. So here's the key. You have two or more markets that have the same commodity or contract or cryptocurrency or whatever it is, and you have matching deals that can immediately, it should 
put the term immediately, capitalize upon the imbalance. The profit being the difference between the market prices. When used by academics, an arbitrage is a transaction that involves no negative cash flow at any probabilistic or temporal state and a positive cash flow in at least one state. In simple terms, it is the possibility of a risk-free profit after transaction costs. For instance, an arbitrage is present when there is the opportunity to instantaneously buy low and sell high. So that's an arbitrage. Now, what I believe is behind the move, and I can't tell you why the move is occurring in silver and not in gold. Let's go ahead and put up a cross of silver and gold so we can see the difference uh, in the different time frames of how extreme this move is of silver. Now, if you remember in the latest move, or in the most recent move, I should say, uh, gold started first, and gold actually rallied early, and then silver, you can see, uh, now we're on the 30 minute, let's push it out to a one hour. So the one hour is really good here, because we can see here that we had this uh, moving gold that started first, um, and then uh, we had a correction back, and then gold started up. But then you can see that silver just took over the leadership of this move. And this goes back to February. So let's pull it out and uh, see how it compares. Again, gold's move from this time frame shows the move in the beginning of the year of gold starting up and pretty much continuing uh, the trend. The trend breaking down a little bit right in here but then not much pullback and then the trend continuing. Whereas with silver, you see not a massive pullback, but a pretty big pullback. Now you can see right now we're looking at a time frame where silver is, uh, is taking off ahead of gold. So how does this connect to what's going on in China and what I believe is behind all this arbitrage? Well, let's think about this. Uh, for the most part, for the last... 30 years, perhaps even 75 years since Bretton Woods, or even maybe 100 years since the Federal Reserve began, uh, the United States and Britain, and then if you look at the London Gold Pool back in the 70s, then it was members, member nations were in Europe, pretty much the Western powers, the United States, England, and the European powers were involved in the gold pool, which was a suppression of the price of gold to maintain the U.S. peg that began with Bretton Woods. So this can go back very, very far. But for the most part, since that time, since the United States dominated the pricing of gold, uh, where the dollar was pegged for foreigners, and foreigners could exchange their gold all the way up until 1971 when Nixon closed the gold window, uh, the U.S. and Western powers dominated the gold and silver markets and could pretty much set the price anywhere they chose. Now, I believe that this is a change in this power structure. And I believe that the reason why is because of the ability to arbitrage these markets. If you think about it, if the Chinese are actually opening an exchange where people can buy silver and gold for the Chinese currency. And of course, they're going to have to convert to the Chinese currency. I don't know the specifics of what currencies are allowed, but let's assume they have to convert to the Chinese currency and then they can buy physical silver and gold, but that is a market that is actually a contract-based market, a market where it's a paper that represents physical, but again, it is a market that you can make an immediate uh, lock-in of price um, in a contract that uh, may not be the equivalent of contracts in the West, uh, probably a kilo-based contract. But again, you can arbitrage that with just the number of contracts. Uh, something like, you know, say 10 contracts there equals seven here, or whatever the ratio is, I have no idea. But uh, you have the ability to go into the Chinese market and buy X amount of 
physical silver or gold and lock that price in. Now, what does that do? Well, if you have a price in China for physical silver and gold that you can lock with a contract that is different in any way than the price that you can lock in the West, then then you have an arbitrage opportunity. Now, imagine if in China they have a silver price. Let's say you do the yuan conversion and it's a relative silver price of, say, $19 an ounce uh, in silver. So all the billionaires in China and multi-multi-millionaires in China are willing to pony up good yuan at uh, $19 an ounce for physical silver to be able to take delivery of that. Well, obviously, if you have any players who are bankers or anyone else who have accounts in both markets, say on the LBMA or the COMEX, and they uh, make a sell of that $19 silver price, and there's a $17.12 silver price over on the LBMA, then obviously, uh, regardless of the amount, let's say it's 100,000 ounces, they sell 100,000 ounces in China and immediately buy 100,000 ounces in the, uh, in the West, in the LBMA or in the comics. And they perform that arbitrage uh, lock-in at that point. So they have bought and sold an amount uh, in two different markets simultaneously. Now, what's the result of that? What that means is if they sold 100,000 ounces of silver in China at $19 and they simultaneously bought 100,000 ounces of silver in London at $17, the end result is going to be that they have to go into London, they have to take delivery of that silver, they have to ship it to the Chinese exchange to make delivery on that $19 silver. Because remember, if it's a contract, then they're required to deliver that amount of physical. And my understanding is the Chinese are requiring physical delivery. So that, in my opinion, is what is behind this move in silver. I think silver's next after gold. This is the first time in, in a very, very long time where there's going to be an arbitrage opportunity between the East and the West. And what that's going to mean is a whole new scenario. It's going to mean that financial players, investors, billionaires, small players, whoever, any person on earth who's able to have an account in both markets, if they see that the price in China for silver is higher than it is in the West, they're gonna lock in their arbitrage and that much silver is going to flow east, and that is going to be a tidal wave. And we'll talk to you next time.